Well, if you've ever come to uh, my house, or more specifically, come to my yard, uh, you will know one thing about me, and that is is that I do not care about landscaping. I don't care. I I was thinking about this this morning. I think in in seven total years of home owner home, home ownership, right? Our house here in Memphis, our house in Kentucky. Uh, combined those seven years, I can't think of a single plant that I have ever planted in the ground. Seven years. Like, that's how apathetic I am about the landscaping and, and care for my yard. Now, I've, like, cut down plenty of things. I've killed plenty of plants, right? I've chopped up some trees, uh, but I've never actually planted. And so you can imagine my surprise, especially when you're moving into a, a new house, right? And, and that first spring that comes, when all of a sudden, magically, there appears some flower that comes out of the yard, right? Or, a, or a, a, a bush that I think is just a bush, and all of a sudden, it's covered in flowers, right? It's a surprise. It's a shock. It's, where did you come from? How did you get here? Where did this beauty come from? Right, I know that it requires some soil and water and sunlight, but I didn't provide any of those things. But thankfully, some previous owner of my house has, right? Some previous owner of my house has brought me those gifts of, of light and life, even where I have not bothered to put it myself. As we come to John, and as John tells us, he promises to us again these same concepts, these kind of nebulous ideas that we have been finding over and over and over again through the story of Jesus, right? These nebulous concepts like belief, right? Faith. Nebulous concepts like life, that you may have life, that you may have real life, that you may have abundant life. All sorts of descriptions that we're not quite entirely sure what they are or, or really concretely how do we get them? Maybe you're a, a, a person for whom the, the story of Christianity, the, the gospel message of Jesus living and dying and rising again has, has never been persuasive and you don't by any means consider yourself a Christian. And yet there is something when you look at the lives of, of some friends, right? Friends that you consider to be intelligent, right? And friends that you consider to be responsible, Friends you consider to be not easily duped or, or confused, and yet they are believers. And you wonder, kind of like that flower that pops out of my yard, where does that come from? How did they get it? Right? Perhaps you uh, are, are like me, someone who has grown up believing in, in these things. Right? Grown up calling myself a Christian and, and grown up knowing the stories of Jesus. And yet I look at other Christians, right? And I look at the way that they enjoy life. I, I, I look at their, their simple and consistent and their persistent faith. And I'm a little taken aback because I know that my life has so much less of it than theirs. And I look at their life like a, 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 a tulip blooming out of the ground, and I wonder, how did it get there? Who planted it? How did it come to be? Here, John is, is making his argument as to where he thinks those things come from. And I think uh, we have some interesting cases to look at. And so the first, we're going to look at these in order. And, 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 and the first is, where does belief come from? And then second, we're going to look at the question of where does life, real life, the kind of life that John is describing, where does that come from? And I want to propose to you here this morning that in our first point, that it's actually doubt that is the soil for belief. It is doubt that is the, the environment where the claims of Jesus' life and resurrection begin to take hold. And I say that because here in our text, we meet this disciple named Thomas, one who maybe you've heard him called Doubting Thomas. And immediately, uh, for, for those of you who have grown up in the church or hearing his story, it, it brings some negative connotations to your mind. But I want to first assert to us 
uh, those of us who that's true, is that doubt is not a dirty word. Doubt is not necessarily a, a dirty word. Indeed, the way that many of us have heard this story or interpreted this story as we read it is that Thomas, right, he, he has heard about the resurrection from his peers, his friends, his colleagues, but he wasn't there himself, right? And, and his doubt is obvious here in verse 25. He says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Right? And Jesus comes, and, and the way the story is normally interpreted or often interpreted, it is that Jesus gives him a rebuke, right? Thomas, you had to see in order to believe. Blessed, how much better are those? How much first class is the kind of faith that doesn't have to ask any questions, that doesn't need any evidence, that, doesn't, uh, that can just exist on its own? And indeed, and much of the world, if you look at the word, the way the word faith is used, that is almost its definition, right? That faith is the notion that you simply believe something, that you believe it without any evidence, that you believe it without any cause, that you simply accept something as truth with no evidence. The problem with that interpretation is that it's exactly the opposite of the one that John has been telling us throughout this whole, uh, this whole book. And we can see it right here. John says in verse 31, I have taken the pains to write this book. I've looked up and, and I've gone through Jesus' life and I've pulled out all the signs, the observable actions that Jesus did in the world which have no, uh, no answer or no fulfillment if not that he was the Christ, the Son of God. John says... I have told you all these eyewitness accounts so that you may believe. You see, for John, he's writing this gospel saying, I'm putting the eyewitnesses on the stands. Far from saying you should just believe me or take my word from it, he's saying, let me line up the evidence that you can see and that you can know. Even in this very text, the one or, or the part of the story we read last week, uh, John, the disciple whom Jesus loves, comes to the, the tomb first. And, and when he saw that the tomb was empty, he says, and then he believed. But he makes a, a point here. He didn't believe because he was expecting it. He didn't believe because he understood that that was probably the best case scenario. It says, we didn't know, we didn't understand the scriptures before now. But seeing the evidence led to belief in what Jesus was doing, seeing the evidence of the empty tomb had made him have faith that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so we quickly discover that, uh, that in John's account of the story, faith is not just digging your head in the sand and ignoring evidence to the contrary. Faith is not just making up what you wish to be true and, and believing it with your whole heart. In fact, quite the opposite, John and the other gospel writers have gone to great pains to try to present to you, to lay out evidence before you that you should believe because of what they have seen. So we see that doubt is not a dirty word, and doubt is not a dirty word specifically because doubt invites you to question. Doubt invites you to take a, a, a second look or a third look or a, a, a hundredth look. Doubt requires you to look again at the story, to, to reinterpret the facts, and, and to doubt whether your assumptions were right in the first place. And so I think that when we come to the person of Thomas, John's message is not for us to look at him and say, don't be that guy. You should have faith that has nothing to do with reality. Instead, I think it's the opposite. I think John is telling us, look at Thomas. Because you're just like that guy. You see, it's easy in the 21st century for us to think of, of ancient peoples, right? Or, or first century peoples and think of them as being rather ignorant, right? Rather stupid, rather easily uh, gullible maybe uh, the word that we would use. 
right? But Tom, but Thomas rubs against that rub. He's in the same place you and I are. He hears from, from John, and he hears from Peter. He hears from Mary. Jesus is risen from the dead, but he goes, no, 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 no. I need to see something before I believe it. See, Thomas was no more prone to believe in the story of the resurrection than, than you or I or any other medical expert who has never once seen a person rise from the dead. Thomas is no more inclined to believe that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus had risen from the dead, than any one of us. But so, so John's invitation is to see, look, Thomas is just like you. Thomas is, is like your, your, your best friend who confirms the news story that you saw on TV. My best friend saw it with his own eyes. Thomas, the one who has the same disposition as you or me. Thomas, who has the same doubts as you or me. He had the opportunity to confirm this message that others had shared. Thomas was like, no way, I'm not going to believe it without evidence. And so John says, Thomas is the perfect place for you and I to see. Because the resurrection is a strange claim. The resurrection is an unbelievable claim, especially, particularly in the first century when it was given. Even modern historians look at this and, and they look at the world of the first century and they see how drastically and quickly Religion in, in the Palestinian era changed and adjusted. How quickly after Jesus' death became a, a, a religion that was based specifically and concretely centered around the resurrection of the dead. And they go, something had to happen here. That didn't just pop up. But that's not just a, a, a fad, right? Resurrection of this kind was unheard of and, and completely inconsistent with the worldview of the people who lived in that time and place. So something had to have happened. And any number of ideas could have come to their mind, right? The first and easiest, right, is to say that Jesus' resurrection was, well, it was a conspiracy, right? Right? Even today, we, we find the lure of conspiracy theories, right? There's uh, the YouTube videos where Bill Gates has the glowing eyes, right? And it's, and it's easy to, to pick up the strand of thought here with the disciples. The disciples just made up this story. They found themselves without power, without authority. And so they came up with this, this rather uh, dubious idea of resurrection. They invented the whole thing a la carte, right? The problem, though, is, as, as John is showing us, is that that idea requires a, a people who would believe it. That conspiracy has, could only work. It could only work if there were people inclined to believe that someone had rose from the dead. And Thomas just showed us that people in that culture were not at all inclined to believe that someone rose from the dead. Thomas demonstrates us as he picks up our words and says, no, 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 until I see physical proof, I'm not going to believe. He demonstrates that nobody expected this to be the case. John even confirmed it so much, right? He said, this couldn't be a conspiracy because we never in our faintest, wildest imaginations would dream of, of saying someone rose from the dead. It was the last thing we ever existed. So if it was a conspiracy, it would require a very solid sales pitch. And instead, what we find is a story that is, is marked by obscurities. Right in the, in the first century, women were not allowed to present evidence in court because they were considered to be too unreliable. And yet John has gone to great lengths to demonstrate to us that the first witnesses, the first people on the scene of the, the crime, so to speak, were women. Mary Magdalene, to be specific, right? He has based his entire testimony upon that which his wider world would never have even listened to. He bases his sales pitch not upon the immediate recognition of what is incontroversibly true, but his story is riddled with the doubts of all his disciples when they first hear the news. None of them, not a single one of them, believes the story of the resurrection until they see it with their own eyes. So no, the conspiracy theory doesn't really work. 
right? So there's uh, uh, other options, right? Uh, people might say, well, the disciples were, were genuinely mistaken, right? They saw something. They had a, a hallucination or a vision or a, or a dream, perhaps even some spiritual awakening or experience in which they received the spirit of Jesus. But Thomas, again, is John's rebuttal to that argument. Because Thomas said, there is no way that I will believe until I touch his physical body. See, Thomas is the antidote to the conspiracy theory. Thomas is the antidote to the the genuinely mistaken theory. In fact, if if you're going to look at the resurrection as a historian, the, the most likely argument is probably that it actually happened. That those women are included in the story because those women were really there. Those women really were the first eyewitnesses. That the the story of the doubts of the disciples are there because that's what really happened. That the story of the empty tomb is there because it was what actually happened. And see, you see, John's argument is not believe without evidence. His argument is, is to say, look, I have first hand accounts that this story is true. He's saying, don't take my word for it, right? Like old reading rainbow. Uh, Listen to to what these other folks have to say. And I think this is important for many of us because uh, particularly if you're not a believer, right? If, If the story of Jesus has never been conceived very often you have been told that, that, that faith is just simply that, uh, something you must embrace, that it's a, a, a dubious step into an unknown, that it's a, a, a fantasy that you must embrace. But Christianity, as, as the authors of the Bible put it, is very much not that case. In fact, it is the doubts, it is your concerns, it is your, you're trying to figure out if there's some other way that John is inviting you to do. John is inviting your questions. John is inviting your doubts. John is inviting your, your, your challenges to what he is saying. And so your questions, your fears, your doubts, they are welcome. And if you are, ever come and, and visit with us or sit with us, I hope you will experience a place in this church community where we are free to doubt, free to question, because it is in questioning that we discover the truth. And if you're a Christian, and, and, and there is very often a, a, a sense of guilt or worry. Every time a, a doubt creeps into your brain and you wonder, if this, is this really true? Is this something that is based on fact and reality? And immediately, a, a dose of fear, am I really saved? Or, or a dose of, of, of feeling like a failure, right? Of guilt creeps into you. And Thomas, I think, points out to us that this is a normal stage, that the Spirit works in our doubts and our questions to bring us to truth. We don't need to be controlled by fear at the narrative. So doubt is not a dirty word because doubt invites us to look. Doubt invites us to consider the evidence. It invites us to consider the claims of Christ. But there's something that, that we intuitively know also is that doubt can destroy. And the, I want to say this because it's important to point out. Because uh, if you are like me, you have watched friends become crippled with doubt. I don't know if this story is real. I don't know if this story is possible. Have we just made this up because it's a, a convenient truth to believe? right? But, and, and oftentimes that shocks us and it, and it rocks us. Because we think, well, if they found reasons to not believe it, then maybe I will as well. And Jesus himself, when he comes to Thomas, he says, Thomas, here, look, here's the evidence. Touch it. Feel it. Believe the story. And then he says this, but do not disbelieve, but believe. You see, the reason that doubt can destroy is because doubt destroys if we remain in the same place. Doubt destroys because doubt has a way of making us throw our hands up into the air and say, I don't know what's true. I can never know what's true. 
doubt becomes a rationale for refusing to keep looking. So instead of, of doubt being that, the soil that the Spirit uses to, to make us inquire and look, to pray, to seek counsel, to talk to contrasting viewpoints, instead of that, doubt becomes a rationale for saying, I don't know what's true. That way I'm not going to read the Scriptures. I'm not going to pray anymore. I'm not going to gather around with people. In short, I'm not going to ask questions anymore. Doubt becomes our excuse for failing to look into it. John tells us the doubt should make us consider the evidence. The doubt should prompt us to, to look. And so the encouragement, I think, from, from John is to be like Francis Schaeffer, this old pastor in the 70s, and, and, and he came to a moment in his Christian life 10 years into the ministry as a pastor, and he began to wonder, is this real? He says, I, I realized that in honesty, I had to go back and rethink my whole position. And for the next two years, he investigated and he actively doubted his faith. That is the kind of doubt that becomes the ground which the Spirit can bring belief. Because it's a doubt that questions, not throws its hands into the air. So the question of where does belief come from? Where does belief come from? It comes when the Holy Spirit of God takes the, the, the dirt, the soil of our doubts, and he uses them to, to question our questions. He uses them to ask us, for, to make us demand what is true. He makes them so that we look and we examine and ultimately we find the flower of faith. See, doubt is the soil for belief if it, as long as it drives us to continue examining the claims of the resurrection. So we looked first at, at where does belief come from, and we said it comes from the ground, the soil of, of doubt. But second, our question is, is where does abundant life come from? Where does this life that John says that if you, uh, if you believe that Jesus is in the Christ, you will receive life in his name? And, and our second point is just that, that it is belief that is the soil for abundant life. It is Belief, that is the soil that the Spirit uses to fashion a life, real life, human life. The echoing of this strange encounter, right? Jesus enters into a room and he breathes on the disciples, right? And it's, it's kind of a, a strange passage. But it's strange, I think, because it's, it is uh, pointing us to another. It's another that comes right at the beginning in Genesis 2-7. When the, 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 it tells us that the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. You see, it was the breath of God into his body, into his nostrils, that made man a living creature. And here in the resurrection, John has taken pains to show us how this is the first day in God's new world. And he highlights that by coming to this text where he looks upon the disciples and he breathes the breath of life into them that they could be reborn, that they could find life in some ways for the first time, to find the life that sin had destroyed, to find the life that their that the doubts and the, the arguments and the, the bitterness of this world had stripped away to find life as God intended life to be. When Jesus breathes the Spirit onto them, he is reanimating them. He is re giving them rebirth into a new life, a life that is fashioned upon their belief. You see, it was after they said, when they were glad to see the Lord, that Jesus comes to them and, said, and breathes on them this new life. So I want us very quickly just to look at, at, at two ways that we see this new life in these words of Jesus. And the first is that we, we see the res restoration of purpose. And now maybe more than ever, as you have sat at your homes, many of you for, for several months, right? And, and you have 
uh, done all of the things to make yourself as comfortable as you can, right? You've watched the entire Netflix library, right? You've maxed out your Amazon Prime. You've waxed out HBO. You've maxed out all uh, Disney Plus, right? You've done everything you can for the purpose of being comfortable, and you feel gross. You feel unfulfilled, right? You were made to be a, a, a living being that moves and acts and, and has purpose in the world, and yet you have played video games for 16 hours a day, and you feel awful. But in the rebirth, Jesus says to them, as the Father has sent me, so even I am sending you. You have a purpose. Secondly, he, he says, not just that you have a purpose, but that you have agency, right? Again, the lifestyle that many of us are living in this time and in this place, right? We can't go to the places we want to go. We can't uh, connect with the people we want to connect with. We can't find new jobs that we would want to hunt for, right? We can't do any of the things that we want to do. We feel powerless. We're stripped of agency. And yet Jesus says in this new life, because you have believed and received me as a new king, he says this, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Jesus is saying, all of this work that I have done, all of the, the plan of salvation, the plan of forgiveness, of redemption, right, the hope of a new world, he says, I'm giving this to you. Not just because you think about the world in a different way, but because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You have agency that this world has never even considered before. You have ability to engage in the world that, that, that just a few uh, months ago they, called, they said I was blaspheming because I asserted that I had this power. What was blasphemous a few months ago is now the norm because of the spirit inside of you. This is not a test. This is not a trial run. This isn't a training exercise. He's saying, I'm sending you into the world to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That where you go and bring the message of forgiveness, it is there that forgiveness will be found. And where you go and the message of forgiveness is not received, it will not be found. You are the agent of God in the world. All of the things that Jesus began building on earth, you are the, you are the one who picks up the baton and continues it on. You, as the Spirit gives you new life. Listen to these words from uh, theologian N.T. Wright. He says, God's intent, God intends to do through us for the wider world that for which the foundation was laid in Jesus. We are to live and to tell the story of the prodigal and the older brother, to announce, to announce God's glad, exuberant, richly healing, welcome for sinners, and at the same time, God's sorrowful, but implacable opposition to those who persist in arrogance, opposition in greed. Following Christ in the power of the Spirit means bringing to our world the shape of the gospel, forgiveness, the best news that anyone can ever hear for all who yearn for it, and judgment for all who insist on dehumanizing themselves and others by their continuing pride and justice. And greed. You say it is belief. It is the understanding that Jesus is the king of a new world and the giver of a new spirit that enables us to become recipients of life. Life as we were meant to have it. Life as we were meant to know it. Life that we were made for. And yet many of us look at our lives and our lives don't feel that abundant. Our lives don't feel that glamorous. In fact, the, the eternal life sounds awful scary to us sometimes. But I think that what this is showing us is that we have not leaned into the reality of our belief statement enough. We have not leaned into the reality of what it means that a new king sits on the throne, what it means that a new spirit lives in our being. 
We've resisted the master gardener's pruning shears as he comes and, and left unchallenged our notions of, of what we live for. What does safety look like? What is money? What is the purpose of money? How relationships ought to work? How do we understand our physical desires and cravings and shortcomings? We leave and, and we leave those things unchallenged because we functionally act like the story of Jesus' resurrection is not true. But in the same way that we need to lean into our doubts, we need to lean into our belief. That we need to lean into the story of what God is doing in the world. Because the farther we lean into what it means to have a new king and a new life and a new purpose, the more that we will find ourselves with a, a, a desire and a hunger to see it more. Uh, this uh, couple weeks ago, I picked up one of these. Um, little, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's, you know, it's like an inflatable pool. It's like 12 feet wide, but it's only two and a half feet deep, right? It's like a, a really big kid pool, right? And I did it because, you know, I, it's the coronavirus. I don't know when my kids are going to be able to go swimming and that kind of thing. And so this gives them a, a space to do it. But the problem was is that the second that they saw that package arrive on the porch, right? The second they saw the picture on the outside of the box, they would not relent. The lifestyle of having a pool out their backyard was so glamorous and so important to them that from my waking moment to when I went to work to, to the text I received while I was here at the office, right, to when I walked through the front door was, when are we going to set up the pool? I, I, I told them, well, we gotta, we're going to have to level off some ground in order to do it. We're going to have to do some digging and, and move some dirt around. And, and so while I was gone at the office during the day, you know, my little uh, four-and-a-half-year-old, he takes a shovel and just starts digging random places where, throughout the yard, right? He's just trying to, to make this thing happen because he can, he can see that a different life, a new opportunity, a new world exists, and he is wholly discontent with a life without a, a pool. Jesus, through John, has shown us that there is new life. And that new life is possible because of, a, of this new belief in what Jesus has done. And he expects us, he tells us this, not so we can feel bad about ourselves, not so that we can, can feel like we don't measure up, but quite the opposite, so that we can understand that though we are dreadfully opposed to the ideas of what Jesus has done in the world, though we, through our, our life and our sins, are so resistant that there is a better way, that he has bought us a, a pool that will transform our summer into one of, of, of joy and happiness, that he has, has built us into a place where we can see our lives with the purpose and with the agency that he has made for us. That we can, can look at, at our doubts and our fears and realize that God has acted as a loving father and paved the way. So while we might look at, at belief, and we might look at, at life, real life, and we think, where does that come from? John has told us that Jesus has given us to us, that the Holy Spirit has been imparted to us so that we can believe, and that by believing, we may have life in his name. Pray with me. Father, we long to be your people. We long to know you and be known by you. Be with us, we pray, this week. Lord, bring us your joy. Lord, bring us the confidence of your assurance. Remind us again of your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.